I have asked Dave to present this evening about his lab and how the virus testing is done. Okay, so I thank you, um, Dave. I am honored to be a part of the Bee Wellness Program to come and talk with you guys. I've run lots of samples out of New York. I've, uh, um, I've been around uh, for a while. So I'm gonna start this off with the first poll question that, that uh, Pat and I have kind of put together. It's, so I gotta get Pat's queued up to do this and go ahead and put that poll question out. It's, a, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you'll see what it is when it comes up. There you go. This is where I, I'd like to start. What's the first thing you notice when you go to your bee yard or go to your hives? What's the very first thing you see or you notice? Anyway, okay. I can't vote, what? <laughs> anyway. I am going to go to the next, uh, my next slide. I was uh, presented with the challenge to find viruses in honeybees. The beekeepers needed a way to test for viruses quickly so that management decisions could be made. And a lot of my first people that I worked with were commercial beekeepers. I was funded uh, to put an instrument into a lab so that the beekeepers would have a way to test for viruses. I don't know how many places you've gone to and or seminars you've gone to and you got somebody out there saying, wow, here it is, here it is. And you're going, how do I do that? You know, even to the simplest part of having a microscope to go look at it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lab for beekeeper, beekeepers and by the beekeepers. So, I love it. Okay. So the answer is, if you think about it, you look out your kitchen window and you see your hives. You drive up in a car or your truck and you see your hives. Uh, the first thing you notice, and this is more important for the commercial beekeepers, is that their hives are still there. Interesting. Everything else is, is good. Uh, so California State Beekeepers uh, was my first meeting, the second meeting. Uh, Wyoming was my first. Montana shared with Wyoming that year. Project APSM funded this, American Honey Producers, American Bee Federation, State Beekeeper Associations around the country, the Almond Board of California, the Montana Department of Agriculture in two forms, and lots of individuals, lots of, lots of others. So, what did we do? We got a system from the Army called the Integrated Virus Detection System. We put a last two years, we put mass spec proteomics in play. We do chemical, uh, standard chemical analysis methods, and we optimize sample collection and preparation. And way back in 2010, we got the scientists and sol soldiers solve a key mystery. Wasn't quite right, but I, I like the headline. That's Jerry Bromenchank in the back holding the frame, and that's uh, Colin Henderson from uh, uh, Be Alert Technologies, both of them here in Missoula. Uh, the in integrated virus detection system. I will, I'll, I'll go over what we do, and then I'll kind of go back and get into the details of where we're, what we're at and what we're doing. But first and foremost is we need to look for viruses. So we got from the Army this integrated virus detection system and it's been in use since 1997. There's lots of publications on that. Uh, currently it's in use here at my lab. There's one on the East Coast in the Army lab. It's a generic virus detector. I don't use primers. I don't use a lot of uh, probes. I, it, it, it looks for unknowns. Uh, uh, it, it'll give me uh, the virus size and it'll give me the concentration. We'll go into that. Uh, typical data will include daily, monthly, seasonal mapping by virus type and concentration. So viruses, they're really small. One micron equals a thousand nanometers. A nosema spore, obviously, is I'm kind of reading here, 15 by 25 microns. 
most B viruses are in the 17 to 46 nanometer size range. Uh, COVID-19 that's floating around is 120 nanometers if you were interested. Basically, if you can see a Nosema spore in your microscope, that's about a thousand times larger than the viruses that I am looking at. It takes more than just a microscope to find your viruses. Here's the technology. This is on the left. That's the main instrument, electrospray on top, classifier, the DMA, differential mobility analyzer in the, in the back there, and a condensation particle counter down here that just simply counts them. This little vial up here in the upper left underneath the ledge is this thing right here. That's your B sample, the little green stuff in this uh, picture. And it goes up into the electrospray, which is this item right here where it controls CO2 gas, uh, electrical charge, and it creates particles, uh, and nano-sized particles with, uh, that are charged. And they come out and they go through the differential mobility analyzer that creates an air spray around it. And that rod right in the middle uh, is charged and the particles are charged but these are graduated particles in this rod and they will uh, separate out all of the charged particles to their corresponding uh, relative charge there, there's corresponding charge big particles and dense particles have a, uh, a higher charge than small particles and um, uh, lower density particles so like beach balls in a swimming pool, a big beach ball is not going to go very deep and it's not going to go very fast when you take it deep. Uh, a handball will go pretty fast and pretty deep in the, in the water. And then when we get down and it's uh, all that's all done and we get it down to the particle counter down here, it takes and releases the charges off of the, uh, the DMA one charge at a time which is equivalent of a, uh, the computer does a wonderful thing. It converts that charge and the mass of it into a spherical size. And then it gives me all of those are uh, individually placed along this DMA and the differential mobility analyzer, then releases to the condensation particle counter and they just flow in there one size at a time and then we just simply count it on the computer. The results over here come out. Uh, for, this is a, an Excel graph taking the data and just put it up. This tall peak on the left is my ammonium acetate. It's my salt to create conductivity. And this little peak right here, you can probably read it. It's influenza A uh, in uh, uh, phosphate buffer solution. Um, the phosphate buffer solution in this case is my uh, my salt instead of ammonium acetate. And this little thing right here, it's basically what I do. I run it through some filters and centrifuge and prep the sample. Okay, now I've put most of it to sleep. How do we know? Uh, here's a uh, sac food virus. I've had detections and I got 44 counts on this thing that went through the uh, condensation particle counter. I confirmed this with proteomics at the Army lab. This was confirmed as the only virus in it. Uh, and it's got a good score, good confidence level. I also ran it through a RT-PCR validation. This is kind of the gold standard of, of uh, virus detection. There's other means and other methods. There's the, there's the uh, well plates and a lot of different analyzers. And we confirmed this. I've done this several times for SACRUD. And way back in 2004, the relationship of SACRUD comes out to, uh, you can see this is a phylogenic tree developed by Judy Chen out of the uh, Beltsville B Lab in 2004. And there's your black queen cell, acute poop B paralysis virus related to cashmere B virus. I will Go back to that a little bit later. Deformed wing virus and Kakugo virus and sac root virus. They're not as closely related, but they are similar to the acute bee and the cashmere bee. Uh, black queen cells up over here by itself, but it's part of this uh, other virus. And this little foot and mouth disease virus, I thought it was really interesting because 
I've been out to Plum Island, New York, on the end of Long Island, and I did a presentation to the um, uh, Foreign Animal Disease Center, and they were very interested in this, and it's the foot and mouth disease was uh, pretty much what they were looking for. Things have changed since then. Little article 2017 came out, and we're going to see a lot of viruses on a phylogenic tree, and these are all closely related. Uh, the, and these are the slow B paralysis virus. I look for that. I look for the deformed wing virus, uh, varroa destructor virus, the La Jolla virus, which was really interesting. I picked that up with my mass spec, but I don't pick it up uh, that I know of in the IBEDS instrument. And then there's sacred virus and perma perina nudo virus. I also picked that up. Uh, I'm not sure what its significant is, but it's there. Okay, so we're still talking about our technology here a little bit. So mass spec proteomics we added uh, a couple years ago. It's been in use since 2008. Uh, my brother, Charles Wick, uh, wrote uh, um, using this as identifying microbes using mass spec. It, as well as the way we've got it set up, is a genetic microbe detector. Bacteria, viruses, and fungus are all detected. Uh, very highly accurate, uh, accurate uh, very good phylogenic classification. Um, we look at that tree and we work our way up the tree if we're not sure what we've got. Typical uh, data includes identification of the microbes in a sample. And they contain hundreds of microbes. And we've got, uh, I've got you know, four computers running as we're talking that are sorting through the latest set of data that I've got. Mass spec proteomics using a LCMSMS. And this one is a same for virus, but if they're using a sample uh, this was developed by the Army Labs out at Edgewood, Maryland. Uh, we take the bacteria cells, we break them up, lysis, is just, we just break the cells, cells up, and then we got proteins, we digest them. Do you like the Pac-Man uh, little symbol on there? My brother put that on. And we digest these proteins with trypsin to the point that digestion is we break them on certain cleavages of that uh, DNA, which is down here, and we break that up on certain points, and we end up with peptides, and then we get this genetic material to DNA transcription, MRA, and from the and and then we understand the proteins. This little symbol right here are the peptides that we have broken it up to. Step two, we go through another electrospray, and we push it into an instrument called a, the mass spectrometer. We run it through twice, and we, uh, it's a big magnet that, that sways the, the uh, weight, the molecular weight of the peptides into different places on the detector. And then we, uh, it also breaks off fragments of them, and we are able to sort those out into the wonderful little, each of these letters is a different amino acid that we're looking for. Okay, so here we go, and we got the peptides coming out, and we've got the the mass charge over here, and then we've got the fragments that are coming out in here. Here's the intensity, and we've got an unknown bacterium that has these three peptides in it. We come back with this unknown bacterium, and then we start going through our database that we go to NCBI, the National uh, Center that library that we go to and download all the sequenced things that are on, out there. And then we just, com the computer, that's what my computers are doing right now, they're comparing. And we end up with a match and we've identified the uh, uh, Y pestis uh, bacteria in this model. Nano liquid chromatography, liquid chromatography, mass spectrometer, and we're using a thermal Finnegan uh, LTQ linear ion trap system. That is a picture of the system. Uh, that's what I have in my lab. We'll see another picture of that later. It's very fast, it's high resolution, and it's, it's very sensitive. And by the way, this is not the state-of-the-art equipment that's out there, but it works for what we need, and it is really robust. 
And what we have done with this is that we, uh, way back when, we found uh, the first detection of varroa destructor virus in North American bees. Uh, that was out in Bee Culture Magazine, I believe, and other publications, Military Times put it out. And there's publications that are out there. We also have two books that my brother wrote, Integrated Virus Detection System and Identifying Microbes by Mass Spectrometry mass spectrometry proteomics and they're they're out there they have just about everything we got okay that's our technology now for what are we doing we're looking for viruses that's what i was brought into this to be doing so we're going to go over a few viruses uh, deformed wing virus probably one of the most famous or infamous viruses that we have around right now belt hunting bees with uh, deformed wing virus appear normal, but are believed to have reduced lifespans. In addition, it has been shown that deformed wing virus infected bees have impaired learning abilities. There's articles that have been written about this. Uh, I had a beekeeper in Oregon that was telling me that uh, his bees were clean. And I found out later, I tested them, and we ended up with a high level of deformed wing virus. I did not see any uh, bees that had deformed wings in the, in the sample that he sent me. But the viruses were there. And I was looking at that, and I'm going, whoa, what's going on? So I called him, and he said, uh, well, yeah, we had a huge outbreak of deformed wing virus, and it seems to have gone away. And I thought I'd send you the samples and see what the, see what the good good bees look like. So my bees, the bees that we sampled had deformed wing virus. They were just not symptomatic. And this poor little bee, this is um, Dr. Uh, Villa Lobos out of the University of Hawaii. And I got this picture uh, from their website. And there is your deformed wing virus right there where my mouse cursor is going over. And they're pretty obvious when you see them. We did uh, a couple studies when we were first got our instrument and we were looking at uh, bees that had deformed wing virus and wanted to know what they were. And the uh, very first samples, uh, Dr. Broman Shank and myself and the beekeeper were pulling off the bees that had crumpled wings on them off of the frames, sticking them in baggies, and then we tested for them. The beekeeper was also picking the bees off. I had rubber gloves on. Jerry had rubber gloves on, and the beekeeper did not. And we ran it through the virus detector that we have, and we came up with a 21.7 nanometer detection. And that was the only detection we had. We ran it through the proteomics at the Army lab, and they came up with mass spec and one of the other high levels of things that they picked up that were not common bee items was they were picking up a lot of human contaminants about that. So we picked up the beekeeper, we picked up deformed wing virus and found that our instrument was actually fairly sensitive. Sac brood virus, affects the brood, uh, larval death. Uh, got a couple pictures that we can show you. The larvae with sac brood be able to pupate and the, uh, the, the sac fluid uh, and it accumulates under the, the sac root virus accumulates under the crushed skin, forming a sac, which is the, um, I don't know what the, kind of the name comes from. Infected larvae change in color from pearly white to pale yellow, and shortly after death, they dry out, forming a dark brown, gondola shaped uh, plug in, your, in there. Sac root virus is the most common virus I pick up. And I have a lot of people that uh, don't agree with me that that's probably the most common virus, but I will stick with my guns and there it is. Rob Snyder from Be Informed, if you're listening, if Rob's on or anybody from Be Informed, thank you. And that's what they look like on the frame. And there's your uh, dark off colored uh, uh, pupae that's been pulled out of a sack. Cashmere bee virus. I couldn't find any pictures of something that looked like cashmere bee virus. It was uh, um, identified from cashmere in the late 70s. 
it, and I'll go along with this, it's apparently more or less harmless unless associated with other pathogens such as Nosema, this one's for apis or varroa mites. Appears to be activated to a lethal state by mites feeding on the bees. And in the lab, once it was introduced to the hemolith, uh, they found that the bees uh, die within three days. I did some study for the state of Florida and they asked me to go to, uh, uh, to, to take some bees out of Grenada. And uh, I did. And they just, I just had the bees and I was looking at them and the, the, the biggest uh, detection I had, the most accumulated virus I had was cashmere bee virus. And I sent my report and said, well, it looks like these bees died from uh, cashmere bee virus. I don't see anything else that would be there. Uh, I wasn't looking for chemicals at the time, but they had a biological kill. They sent me back the information going, huh, well, we came to the same conclusion. It was cashmere bee virus. So I, my data came out and it looked right. Acute bee paralysis virus, I also see this. Uh, normally not thought to cause disease symptoms in bees. I don't, it can be uh, common in non-infectious form. I see it often. I don't know that I've seen bees die from uh, acute bee paralysis virus, but they do. When it is injected to the hemolymph, similar to the um, cashmere bee virus, uh, the symptoms become very severe and the bees die quickly. So one of the symptoms that I have written down here is the bees, the brood is badly cared for, adult bees lose their orientation abilities, uh, and they also have paralysis. It's really acute bee paralysis virus is closer to related to the previous one and can kill bees in the laboratories. Bees that are injected, 90% of them die of three to five days. It's presented in their food. The death rate is about 90 or 80%. Chronic paralysis virus, similar to those suffering for uh, symptoms, suffering from tracheal mites. And this is the virus that uh, a lot of people will say my bees were sprayed with a chemical and uh, they died. And the symptoms are as the trembling bees crawl out on the ground, uh, dislocated wings or a K-wing, not to be confused with the K-wing virus, swollen abdomens, dysentery, mite infestation. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, well, if, if you got mites, you can probably have this. I picked this up quite a bit. And uh, this is probably the, I'll get into a, where it's at. It's the second or third most uh, uh, prevalent virus that I pick up. And it comes in, all these viruses are seasonal. Uh, the second type symptom, syndrome is the hairless black syndrome. Because the bees lose their hair, appear shiny, black, or greasy. They can't fly, but they tremble and they crawl about. So here's Here's a picture of a uh, bee with chronic bee paralysis virus. Notice how black it is. Notice how shiny it is. And part of the shininess comes from the other bees picking off the hairs on the bee. And this came from window bee. Okay, remember those uh, phylogenic trees? It gets more complicated. These are all the different types of chronic bee paralysis virus. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of different aspects. So these are worldwide. These are uh, Uruguay, Poland, France, Hungary, Switzerland, China, Japan, US. There's a lot of them. And we're trying to look for them. If the change becomes too much, uh, the typical methods of, of uh, PCR will not see some of these if they don't have the right sequence, which would be there's numbers here at the end of it. Black queen cell virus affects the queen pre-pupae and pupae sealed in cells. I can affect the queens. Uh, I don't see that too often, but I have seen it. Um, mostly the association with the Nosema apis. This is back in 
2006 American Bee Journal. And there is a queen cell with a black pupae in it. There are hints, and this comes from Rob Snyder again. Good for Rob, he takes pictures, I don't. I had Jerry uh, have some bees come in. Jerry Bromenshank had some bees come in uh, in queen cells. Uh, they were running the queens and they, a, a few of them were dead and I, I ran them. He just gave them to me. This was early on and I, I ran these and I was going, whoa, what's this? My salt peak, that little peak off to the left and the 17.5 nanometer peak is a uh, satellite virus. And the 33.4 was the only peak I had out of a dead queen. And we confirmed this with the proteomics as a black queen cell virus. This queen did not die by abuse or getting tumbled about or uh, traumatic shock, but it actually got, uh, uh, died probably from this virus, which was interesting. And none of the other queens had it. Okay, so poll question number 30, which should be the second one come up. And I will kind of keep on going here a little bit. So great, I got viruses, now what do I do? That was one of the very first questions I was asked in 2007 when I started showing everybody that they got viruses. They had, and I'm looking at it and I'm going, I don't know much about B viruses. I'm learning, I'm studying. And uh, it's 13 years ago and I've been looking at them. So which virus is the most problematic to your hives? Good question, huh? Any answer is a good answer. So, okay, so what do you do? Sometimes doing nothing is the right answer. The bees will handle the virus, sacred virus, pay attention. You may have, you want to check. Uh, see what you got. Uh, okay. The winning question is the one that's actively replicating growing in my bees or hive. Very good. Because you're going to see the other viruses. The bees have viruses. Nutrition. Over time, in talking with beekeepers and getting feedback on what we're seeing and what the beekeepers are doing uh, and, and uh, sequential testing where we test and find what we've got. And then we test again uh, in a few weeks or a month later or two months later. And all they did was feed, uh, feed the bees. And I also found, or they got into a good flow, not a good flow, but a good pollen uh, supply from fresh flowers. And the viruses tend to disappear. I also did some study with essential oils. And if you put essential oils on in certain circumstances, they do work. My favorite is peppermint oil. Um, and during Christmas season, it becomes obvious. But essentially, that's the one that has the most effect on B viruses. And I think that's a direct effect on it. Okay. Treat the mites. Obvious. Treat the mites. Why? Mites are a vector. We'll get into that a little bit later too. Uh, viruses. Uh, you got to get rid of those two little piggybacks on the back of the uh, of the honeybee. These guys are just landing. They're probably not feeding yet. They're going to crawl around to the other side, I believe, and start feeding. But uh, this picture came from Cornell. And the bees, uh, the mites put the holes in the bees. Remember those two, three viruses that we were talking about? You got holes in the bees and they get uh, cashmere acute or chronic bee paralysis or Israeli acute paralysis virus. And these viruses are being introduced by these mites uh, because the mites are carrying them and they, uh, the bees are uh, in danger of uh, getting really sick. So get rid of the mites. Okay, a mite story. Um, there's drift that goes on in hives. You guys all know about drift. That's when the 
neighboring bees come into another hive and they play bridge or pinochle or they just have, us have a social event, have a beer with each other, right? Okay, the bees drip. They also will rob out another hive. Robbing, I have gotten uh, kind of words that you got robbing going on with the, with the bees. Well, as the, as the hive is collapsing or as the bees are getting sick and you got all these mites in there, the mites will jump onto the back of the bee and when that bee is done robbing or playing pinochle, it'll go back to its own hive and all these mites will jump off and go find a new home. Uh, we call those Uber bees. I came up with that one when I was out in DC uh, riding an Uber drivers and we packed a car full of people and they said, oh man, we're just like mites on a bee. Anyway, sorry. Okay, treat for nosema. Nosema will weaken your bee and cause the bees to be susceptible to other pathogens. Okay, poll question number 76. Pat, in case you're listening. Okay, use of probiotics. And the question is going to be related to that. There's lots of people out there. My wife actually convinced me to use probiotics after I've had pneumonia a couple times. And we're going through and, and uh, I'm on antibiotics. And after I'm on the antibiotics, she goes, oh, you got to be on this probiotic uh, uh, milk. And so I'm on the probiotic milk and finally figuring out what I'm supposed to do. And now we're putting probiotics on the bees. We're also treating with teramycin and we're also exposed to chemicals, uh, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, which some of them have a antibacterial effect. So when do you put that on? Before or after a nosema mite treatment or an antibiotic treatment? Uh, knowing all these may have an antibiotic action. You put it on before, after, both, or never, okay. Of both. After. Good for you guys. Uh, never. Okay, I'll go with never. Some people do that. That's that's fine. Before, eh, you can. It's going to be eliminated. You're going to have to put it on after if you do that. Anyway. Okay, what do you do with the viruses? Use them as measurement tools. I, uh, we'll get into some charts. Use regular virus monitoring as a tool for evaluating bee stress in reaction to outside factors. Bees have viruses. Not all of them are symptomatic, like the uh, uh, deformed wing viruses, outer organ, but they are a drain on the bee resources. Sac root virus, it skyrockets when, uh, when the bees are treated. Monitor the viral loads for selective breeding. I've got a couple queen breeders or, uh, yes, uh, queen breeders in, uh, they sell nukes. Monitor the viral loads. They select the bees that they're going to breed based on all the things that they typically do. And the last thing that happens is that they select the, uh, they look at the virus load and see if the viruses are resistant or tolerant. Tolerant means you've got a high viral load, but but the bees are looking great, and the other is the uh, the bees are looking great, and there's no viruses. Uh, you can also use it as I did in Florida. If there's a chronic pesticide problem, the viruses will show up in a different manner in relation, especially with the bee weight. Uh, the mite influences will affect the uh, the bee viruses. Uh, nutrition evaluation, evaluations, you can see if their nutrition is having an effect on your bees. And we're going to go into a project that I did a while back. And this is a dose response curve for a Nosema uh, treatment. Then this is measuring the sac root virus. There's a couple other detections that are pretty low that might be there. And this is a uh, raw chart that comes out of, uh, out of Excel from the data files not my typical bar charts that I'm using now. Uh, prior to treatment, uh, prior to treatment, this gave a baseline. So 
there's your prior to treatment uh, levels. This told us kind of where the bees were at when we started testing them. Uh, 10 days after the treatment, the viral load skyrocketed. And that's, that's, uh, that's a, a, quite a bit. Uh, the bees were in a worse state than when we started. The immune system was not responding well. By the way, uh, fumadillin, fumadil is uh, used in veterinary clinics as an immune suppressant. And we use it to kill the mites. I thought that was pretty interesting. Don't know much more about that than that. 16 days after the initial treatment, fumagillin can drop off. The vital, viral titer dropped to a very low level, lower than when we started. The bees were back to a healthy state. The immune system responded well. Uh, and so you can use the bees as a biomarker. You should know what viruses you have. If you have a cashmere bee virus, which is kind of benign unless you have something else in there, and, you're, and uh, you treat it with uh, fumagillin, which is available again, I believe, and you treat it with fumagillin, uh, you're likely to get your bees really sick from the virus, not from the fumagillin. Stresses to the bee colony can be measured by the increase or decrease in the virus titers. Okay, so these uh, scientific reports and Dennis Anderson and John Roberts and Peter Durer put this together um, and looking at Australian uh, 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 varroa destructor, looking at honeybees. Uh, the, they were looking at um, Apis mellifera colonies across Australia and they were using uh, RT-PCR, uh, next generation sequencing NGS, and five viruses were prevalent, black queen cell virus, sac brood, acute uh, IAPV and uh, Lake Sinai viruses one and two. Uh, and that was the, uh, the first time those were detected in Australia. They also showed several viruses were absent in their sampling, including deformed wing virus and slow bee paralysis virus. Their findings indicated that viruses can be highly prevalent in Apis mellifera populations independently of the virus of the varroa destructor. Yes, I can go along with that. Uh, the hypothesis that co-pathogenic interaction of varroa destructor and deformed wing virus is a key driver in colony collapse, uh, colony losses. Additional stressors such, such as pesticides, poor nutrition, etc., may enable more severe and frequent colony losses to occur. Further on, in his research, uh, multiple stressors, parasites, pathogens, chemicals, poor nutrition, climate, and beekeeper management. Uh, you guys probably don't have any beekeeper management problems. It's, uh, New York is pretty good. Most significant of these factors uh, seems to be the parasitic mite, raw destructor. It feeds on the developing honeybee larvae and the adult bees. It's not only a set, you know, they're about the size of a small dinner plate on your back and they're, and they're chewing on you. The bees can't get rid of them. It, uh, it just is a stress on the bees. And the, the, the two ways, you got uh, the viruses. Uh, there was a paper I just saw come across my desk on a, on a highlight was that uh, they're showing that the uh, Varroa destructor uh, one virus grows in the varroa destructor mite and in the bees, and that you've got some evidence that other viruses are also growing in the varroa destructor mite. And so not only do they regurgitate that into the bees as a vector, but also they have viruses on their surface because they're crawling around the bees, crawling around the hive, and anything that's there is on the mite. And there you go, you have a, uh, two types of vector for those bee viruses get into the bee and not through the normal means of, of ingesting it. Typically, if they're ingested, they're just benign. Uh, as covert infections in honeybee populations, the outbreak occur when colonies become stressed and their stressors are up above and that's why we measure the stress and certain environmental conditions. The expansion of a varroa destructor 
significantly increased the colony stress and elevated the importance of uh, the uh, monitoring viruses. Okay, here's where I step in. I started doing reports. They started out pretty simple. And here's my summary page. Some of you may have seen this. This lasted for a couple of years and I changed it again. That's where I'd take your sample ID and put it off on the left side. Nosema spore count. I count your Nosema spores that come in. I'm finding that I am almost as accurate as a, uh, um, a microscope out in the field. Well, no, I, my, my Nosema spore counts, they are microscopes. Where is it? My mites per bee. I'm as accurate as a uh, sugar wash or a uh, um, alcohol wash or uh, sugar dusting. And I measure the bee weight when it comes in. I've done thousands of these. I find it's actually fairly consistent. Uh, bees that are out in front of the hive have been lying on the ground, number one. And if they're not decomposing, they're going to be dehydrated and the bee weight's going to be off. But uh, I find that it's pretty consistent. This is my latest uh, data summary chart. Again, the sample ID, the viruses that I'm picking up. You know, SEMA spore counts and millions of spores per bee, the bee weight, uh, the mites per 100 bees. Uh, I have a Raman instrument in my lab as well. And I put a scale on that. Uh, I'll show you the Raman slides here in a second. And all it is, it's a, it only takes me a couple of seconds to use a Raman instrument. Ramen is not noodles. That's my lunch. Ramen is a uh, laser light of a specific wavelength that is shown on a chemical and it has a uh, fluorescence, but it also has the specific fluorescence uh, wave uh, shift, frequency shift for that chemical that comes out very accurately. Uh, it's not as sensitive as I would like it. I've, I've scaled it down, but it is really quick. And it gives me a heads up as to what I'm kind of looking at. And then I've got a bee gut. Uh, we'll go through all of these a little bit uh, later in the presentation. So I put notes on, and I think that what I'm looking at in the ramen is some sort of treatment going on in the bees. Uh, it's, it's, um, then I look at the bee gut bacteria, and I've got a little spend some time on that. The higher number is better. This is just an index. And then uh, I got an environmental quality index for the microbes. Lower numbers are better. These are all a little bit on the high side. We're still trying to figure this one out. Uh, January before last, I was asked by the EPA to uh, join in a study uh, challenge internationally on looking for viruses in uh, wastewater. They gave me the viruses that they wanted to look at and they wanted to find seven individual virions in a liter of water. That was the challenge that I just came up and faced. And I went through, uh, did, the, did the math, did the project on it. And uh, I actually won the project, but they gave me second place in the international competition. It gave me second place because my approach was they were not a, they were not aware of my technology. They were not uh, uh, they were I was referred to them by a friend that had seen the technology, but the group that was evaluating it had not seen it, and they awarded the guy that came in second place because he was using standard methods, and he was kind of innovative as well. And he came up and he won it, but we ended up with all this data from this water study. And we found that the bees go to water in the fields and they're bringing back microbes, chemicals, just about everything else you can shake a stick at. And so we just decided that we'd, we'd start doing that. I don't know what these numbers mean, but they're there. Most of you have, uh, that have done my sampling, this is a typical uh, high, medium, low chart and it didn't come out. These ones are usually a, a square circle or a half circle or an open circle. And that's uh, uh, Jerry Bromenshank came with the consumer digest mode of looking for them. So deformed wing virus has several different sizes. All of these viruses have a little bit of different sizes. And I just had a discussion earlier today based on a paper that was written on saccharid viruses on the capsids is that one of the things that I pick up is I pick up the capsids. 
that might be relevant to the uh, my peak shift on these. All viruses do produce their capsids and they are present. If you have a capsid and you're using PCR, uh, you may be blank. You may show up negative because there's no genetic material to look at. And that was really interesting because I've, I've shown detections and PCR has shown no detections. And that was a nice, interesting comparison. So here is a sample from 2019 from the wellness group. The samples on the left are from May. This group was July, August, September, and December of the last year. And the, the uh, plum colored stuff is uh, uh, the B weight. The blue is the uh, Nosema spore counts. The bright red is sac root virus. The green is cashmere B virus. Or is that, that's, no, I'm sorry, it's not cashmere, it's the chronic B paralysis virus. So you can see that the weight changes over the year uh, reflects many things. This is just the raw data. So I take the data and I send out reports that look like this. Just, this is the December sample. I got three samples that came in. Uh, I added my ramen uh, detection for chemical analysis. The B weight is there, the saccharide viruses are there, and the chronic um, paralysis viruses are also there. Uh, then I usually on my reports, if I've been receiving samples from you all, all year long, I'll compare it to the previous sample sets. Uh, those of you that have participated with wellness have seen this chart. And this has got the Nosema is now a yellow. The B weight is the uh, tan. Um, sac root is still red. Green is still the chronic B paralysis. And you can see in May, there was some Nosema in August. One of the hives that took off went a little bit higher. September, it's all gone. And in December, you've got a little bit of Nosema in there. The B weight in uh, September was higher. We're going down in December, but it's typical August. The bees were doing well. The viral load is a little bit low other than in the first sample, which is a rather low bee weight. So I also add to the bee weight. I look at it and I'm going, okay, I grab a handful of samples that I'm taking from others around the country and I throw it in there from the same time. And then I just take your bee samples and there's your comparison. You can see that they're a little bit on the low side. They're not the lowest, but they're not the highest. And by the way, uh, the B weight, the lowest B weight I've seen came not from the B wellness group. And it was, it was bees were still alive. They were down at, uh, and these are all uh, multiplied by a hundred. So this would be uh, in grams, that would be, uh, um, 0 0.14, I think, yeah, that's, that's right, 0 0.14 grams or 0 0.08 grams for an individual bee weight. The heaviest bee I have weighed came out of the bee wellness group. And it was from a beekeeper that was paying attention, treated their bees really well, and the bees thrived. I was very happy with that. A beekeeper should be proud. And no, it wasn't uh, Pat. <laughs> Sorry, Pat, I just threw you under the bus. Okay, so uh, a beekeeper out of California, um, uh, David Bradshaw, I'll give him credit for this. He asked me, how are my bees doing virus-wise compared to everybody else uh, that you're looking at? And at the same time of the year, where, where do I stand? So I made a chart of my average low, my median, and my average high. And these are the, this is the chart that came off of the wellness group for this beekeeper. And you can see that uh, I put in a, uh, a trend line and I ended up on this chart with a error in my trend line. But the median high or the average high is exactly where it's supposed to be. And you can see that sac root virus and uh, uh, chronic paralysis virus are both higher than what I'm seeing nationally and overall in my in all of my database uh, 
it gives you just a kind of a scorecard. Where are you at? Seasonally, late winter. These are the frequencies that I see each of these viruses. Late winter, I don't see a lot of viruses. Uh, the Israeli acute B paralysis virus, cashmere B virus, run about 4%. Deformed wing virus is even a little bit lower than that. Sac root virus is uh, my highest. Chronic B paralysis is my second highest late winter Bs. Spring, okay, this is after the first brood cycle or second brood cycle comes out after the bees have come out of uh, winter. And this is not counting the, this, is, this did not include my Florida bees. Uh, but you can see that I jump up that about 47% of all my samples are gonna have uh, saccharide virus in it. Uh, the IAPV, cashmere, deformed wing jumps up. It's still around 14. And the chronic paralysis virus shows up at about 29. And I found an interesting part too, is that uh, I haven't isolated it specifically, but uh, Lake Sinai virus one and virus two are related to the chronic bee paralysis virus. Again, I may actually be including uh, I, uh, the uh, Israeli, I'm sorry, the Lake Sinai viruses. I think that's interesting. I have, I'm working on that. Uh, in the mass spec proteomics, I do pick them up. Late summer, my viruses are going up uh, and down. It, they're just variables depending on what, what's happening. So these that are in almond production, I know most of you are hobbyists, but here's just an interesting little thing that I've seen, uh, is that bees that migrate to California pretty much know what their viral load looks like when they go in. And uh, they spend the time down there for the almond pollination. Chronic bee paralysis virus is the uh, common virus I see down there. And uh, I did, I, uh, and the chronic bee paralysis virus is the most common virus coming out. It is shared across the board with everybody or most everybody. And it's just, uh, I did a uh, environmental study in the daycare where I was, took a Q-tip and I was swabbing doorknobs and then bring it back to the lab and tested it. I did mirrors, did toys. And there were viruses everywhere. My take home on the, on the uh, daycare study, uh, don't touch anything lower than your elbows in a daycare. They're just rhinoviruses or cold viruses. But I look at the pollination in uh, almonds in, the, in February, March, and your bees are going to be just like in a daycare. They're going to come home with it. They're all going to share the viruses. Okay, so our friends in uh, the National Bee Diagnostic Center in Canada, I grabbed this chart from them, giving them credit for it. They had a nice study that was on the web, and they uh, did a share of the location is up on the right. This was uh, uh, identification and quantification of viruses affecting honeybees in the Peace County, Peace Country, I'm sorry. And I noticed down here, their most dominant virus is the saccharid virus. I would agree with that. IAPV is their second one, uh, deformed wing virus. Back over here, they don't have as many apiaries with that, but it's there, cashmere bee virus and acute bee paralysis virus. They did not do chronic bee paralysis virus. I would, I would love to know what that was. But this is interesting. It's a uh, mild confirmation for what I've been seeing over the years. Okay, coming back to the wellness program. These are the bees, as you saw this graph earlier. I'm gonna sort these things and I'm gonna remove the bee weight and look at the bee viruses. And then I'm going to sort it by the B weight. So this is all of your data. This is all the months combined, all of the data combined over 2019. And I've got over here on the left, I've got an interesting item coming along. The lower weights are on the left, the higher weights are on the right. And then the blue line is the Nosema spore counts. The higher counts are on the left and the lower counts are on the right. 
that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do that, put a circle around that. That is monitoring what's going on in your hives. That stands out. If you're checking your bees over time, this is what they're going to look like. Okay, this is something to be aware of. This is something you want to fix. And you fix that by going back to, well, I got viruses. What do I do? Nutrition, get rid of the mites, treat the nosema, uh, essential oils. Check your bee gut microbes. Uh, from the Royal Society Publishing uh, Biological Science, they were talking about, uh, notice I didn't have a reference on that. I should have that. Okay, and here's their abstract and the things that stand out. Microbes themselves may represent a major diet a resource for developing bee larvae. And I was going to conventions, I was listening to people talk about the gut biome, to the bee gut biome, to the other microbes. And despite their apparent importance in sustaining bee health, evidence leaking pollen-borne microbes to larval health is currently lacking. Microbe deficient pollen provisions before being fed to a developing larvae is what these guys did in the study. Convergent findings from amino acid and fatty acid trophic biomarker analysis revealed the larvae deprived of a substantial amount of nutrition from microbial prey and occupied a significant higher trophic position than that of strict herbivores. Uh, basically, larvae that were being fed on an increasingly sterile diet experienced significant adverse defense effects on growth rate, biomass, and survivorship. They concluded that microbes associated with aged pollen provisions are central to bee health, not only as a nutritional mutualist, but also as a major dietary component in an era of global bee decline. I think this paper is a year old, year and a half old. The cons conservation of such bee microbe interactions may resent an important facet of pollinator protection strategy. Okay. And the chart that stood out to me in all of this was they had fed pollen to the larvae. They sterilized it and they gave up with a gradient from 0% sterile to 100% sterile. They got rid of the bacteria off of the pollen. The 0% sterile was the highest weight and 100% sterile was the lowest weight. Go figure. Poll question number 56, if I missed one before. Uh, Pat, you're on. Okay, we're looking at B weight now. What does the B weight indicate? Age of your bees, the health of the hive, how are your bees relating to various stress factors? Are the bees doing after a treatment of some sort? All of the above? No, I should have put none of the above on there. Um, okay, so this is a little bit harder, but I kind of go in over a bunch of this stuff so you guys can take a look at it. And by the way, the beekeeper that told me to start measuring bee health was uh, um, out of California, told me to add the bee weight to it. And he's been around for a long time. It was Steve Park out of Park Apiaries. All of the above, good for you guys. Good for you guys. It does indicate all of the above, okay. Healthy bee team, I'm on their mailing list and here's what came in my email and I just copied it because it had this little blob in it. Lack of biodiversity. Pollen, especially when obtained from a variety of plants, is the ideal source of nutrition for bees. Wildflowers in late summer, midsummer. Uh, that's why we have so many beekeepers here in Montana. That's why they're out in the Dakotas, uh, both north and south, upstate New York. I think you guys have a lot of wildflowers. The monocultures by nature limit the biodiversity available to bees. And we feed them sugar and corn syrup. Uh, <laughs> almost went down a rabbit tail. 
And these are often produced in a chemical refinery, uh, making those sugars. And here we go. One straightforward solution we could be to cultivate nearby gardens uh, with nectar. The, uh, there's a couple of groups out there that are pursuing that. Go to conventions, they're giving away uh, wildflower seeds. Pollen rich plants. I was at a convention, I was uh, here a few years ago, and I was looking at my data and I'm going, you know, the bee weight's important, nutrition's important. So my presentation was on bee weight. And Marla Spivak got up, she was talking about important of nutrition. Gloria de Grande Hoffman out of uh, the, uh, the Arizona Bee Lab, she was talking about nutrition and the importance of it and how it degrades over time sitting in a warehouse. Marla was, uh, I asked her earlier this year about, uh, you know, she have any choice on that anywhere? So she goes, no, fresh pollen is the best. It is, you know, go for it. We got, uh, I might get to that a little bit later, but here's my latest summary chart. The bee gut bacteria, the quality index, uh, higher number is better, yes. Uh, so you would come back to, here's a chart. I will probably start including some form of this in my reports. These are two bee samples that I did, and these are the different levels of the uh, different bacteria I picked up. Actually, there's three samples in here, the gray, orange, and the blue. And you'll notice there's some vacant spots, and this is going to change. It is going to change about as often as your floral source changes. So if you're putting a probiotic on and you're saying, well, I put my probiotic on and boom, uh, well, it was it the right probiotic. I'll go to, I'll go to my, my little story here after this slide. This was a, uh, these are the seven families of bacteria that are on those previous charts. Uh, some of them are, uh, uh, members of pretty harsh uh, bacteria, but they are present. Some of them are nice, some of them are uh, pleasant, some of them are benign, but they are all there. They all serve us a role. And on my next chart, okay, so bee gut bacteria. And when you get this chart, I'm gonna try to make a graph out of this. It's a lot of data to look at. Uh, maybe best viewed when you get my paper to get my report to you know be able to zoom in on it so you can see the numbers. And these are all uh, measuring, uh, consistently measuring the unique peptides that we're detecting uh, out of these things from the uh, LC mass spec from the proteomics. And okay, so we were looking at this. I was looking at the bees going, there's my little story, and the bees going to pollination. And I was looking at that going, well, almond pollen is a pretty high quality protein. And then I was looking at the probiotics and I'm going, okay, so every pollen, every wildflower, they all have bacteria on them. And I was going, okay, that's pretty interesting. The bees are harvesting the bacteria off of the pollen. That's kind of going down that road for a while. Still am. Uh, I was also looking, somebody handed me a paper that came out of the 1920s going back to my roots in botany. And I was looking at it and when the pollen pollinates the plant, it goes to the stamen, starts traveling down the stamen so it can mature and develop into the fruit of the plant. And I was looking at that and one of the things that happens in the stamen and on the way is that the, the a, an enzyme is pr produced specifically for that pollen on the on the uh, the plant, so it appears, in my opinion, that the bacteria are harvesting the enzyme that is helping to digest that specific pollen for that spe specific plant. Uh, there's others that will do the same, but it looks like this is specific. And then the uh, the bee the <laughs> The bacteria are farming the enzymes for their own nature. The bees are farming the bacteria. And we did a little study and we found the enzyme in the bee bread. We found the enzyme in the 
bees. We found it in the uh, honey. And we're looking at that going, wow. Well, what happens in California? They put a bloom extender, a fungicide on the, uh, I think it's a fungicide, on the almond blossoms to extend the pollen. I grew up in central Washington, and you guys in New York understand apples. I grew up in the apple fields, apple orchards. And extending the blossom means you're trying to increase the number of bee visits to each flower so that you have a higher yielding tree. When they put that fungicide on or that chemical on, one of the side effects is an antibiotic. Remember going back to the antibiotics? Boom, you get nailed with it. And then you, you go into it and you're going, okay, the bees are not bringing back their antibiotic, the, the enzyme because it's not on the bacteria because the orchard has killed off the bacteria and the bees aren't thriving like they should be. Okay, just an interesting story. So here's a chart and I'll go back for this data for is new for these reports. It's I'm still trying to figure out what they all mean and how they mean. Zormal, zeros may be normal based on the floral source. Uh, it appears that a higher count would be better. Uh, I don't have a lot of data to draw from on what this actually means in this format for bee gut bacteria. Nosema spore counts. We look at millions of spores per bee. Nosema uh, has negative effects. This came from Eric Musson. You guys are all familiar with it. This came out in Eric Musson in 2011. Uh, diagnostic services, again, from the, uh, the Canadian lab looking at the uh, uh, nosema spore counts. And then you look at the, one of the things that happens is that they defecate all over the front of the hive. It's fairly obvious, right? Okay. I also look under, this is my LC mass spec proteomics data that uh, we look for nosema and this is a positive detection. We got uh, 79 total peptide counts on this one sample. Easy, simple data to look at. I also have a microscope in the lab and I took this picture with my iPhone. And all those little rice grains are on there. Those are Nosema spores. And the bigger round objects, those are uh, pollen. That's is out of a ground up bee that I look at. And I simply count these things. There's a lot there to count. Here is a, another slide. Uh, magnified by 400. Here's another one, and this is not a star encrust, encrusted uh, nosema spore. It, I just wanted to point it out that there it is. A lot of things to look at in here. And we're going to come up to poll question number 89. And the question is going to be, what is this picture of? This is a bear claw. I jumped when I saw it. I was looking for nosema spores. And this came across my field of view. This is magnified by 400. A piece of the wing interconnection, a piece of the black hairs, an alien hand part, a piece of the leg, and or a pollen sack. What, what do you guys think it is? My answer, I don't know. So I'm curious as to what you guys got. Okay. I'm going to look at chemicals and bee gut bacteria, and I'm probably going to run out of time here. So, oh, good for you guys. That is a popular answer. It's not a bear claw. Nobody answered that. An alien hand part. Oh, there's your sense of humor. Okay, good for you guys. This is some data I got from Nancy Moran's uh, website uh, out of the uh, University of uh, Austin in Austin, Texas, I think it was. Glyphosate perturbs the bee gut microbiota of honeybees. Glyphosate is everywhere. Makes, uh, makes young worker bees more susceptible to serratia. This is one of the serratia marcins that we were looking at on that bee gut, uh, my seven groups. And back, it's an opportunistic bacterial pathogen. I'm not sure of the exact role that I'm finding, but we will figure it out. But they uh, 
were looking at it, a loss of what they found was a loss of gut bacteria pronounced three days after exposure to glyphosate. And when they returned to the hive, type of gut bacteria, uh, some types of gut bacteria were more vulnerable to glyphosate than others. However, they found that younger worker bees became more susceptible to a known bee pathogen called serratia, increasing their risk of day, death. We find a lot of serratia on the surface of the bees. That's in that uh, um, environmental package. Sorry. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of cruise through these things. The bee gut bacteria contains an enzyme targeted by glyphosate. Remember those enzymes? Vary in whether they possess susceptible, exposure to the bees glyphosate alters the bee gut community, increases the infection to opportunistic uh, colonies. And here is your gut bacteria, and there's a phylogenic tree. Uh, it's a lot. I'm going to skip this poll question. Uh, basically, I'm asking if the uh, bee gut bacteria is an important part of bee health. My pesticide or chemical scale of 1 to 10, there is the ramen versus a blank test tube, and that was a fine one. Here's my ramen. Remember, these only take a couple seconds for me to develop this. Uh, less than, well, about 30 seconds. And this is a detection. I would scale this one about a 10. I got, uh, needed more detail, so I went to uh, catcher's process, which is coming back to the mass spec. I needed more detail. And this is the way I extract the uh, chemicals out of the sample. Here is the LC mass spec liquid chromatograph. And here is the data that I look at. There's the instrument. We saw a picture of it earlier. Here is my data. This is what I wanted to look at. I'm going to look at chemicals. I got 15 of them. I got herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. I have a couple neonics on here. I have a uh, malathion. I have kumafos. Uh, how come I have malathion? Because I can pick it up out of the store and get a uh, get a pure sample or a known quantity. And that's how I calibrated to come up with all of these uh, rates. And these are all in parts per million. You might want to zoom in on this one. And this is be your immunocloprid. Uh, sorry. Okay. And that's the B micro microbiome. That's what I see out of the mass spec. This is what comes up on this part in environmental quality. And this is the last paper I'm going to go over. This was uh, this is the um, a paper that was put together um, on what do we do about the microbiome. It is likely to be a critical factor affecting host health. Okay, it's everything. That's all the bees. The the bacteria, the, uh, the funguses that are there, the, the environmental. How do, we, how do we look at them? How do we do? It's, it's unclear. And these guys got together. There's a lot of them. I know a bunch of them. Um, they're doing a great project trying to create some standards, uh, trying to create some databases, trying to create what are we looking at? Are we all looking at the same thing? Are we all uh, doing the same type of thing? They're using simultaneous screening for S16 RNA genes. They're using quantitative PCR, total individual microbial loads, proper metadata needed for interpretation and comparison of results. Standardization of protocols, uh, methods for isolation of host bacterial, viral DNA, RNA, and necessary for cross-study analysis. Notice they left off my uh, rapid detection system, but that's all right. I am uh, low mountain totem pole. I agree with this, you gotta do it. This is why I'm your lab. You don't have the equipment in your backyard uh, to be able to do this. That's why I'm here. What I do, I do honeybee testing. Uh, I test in services, I got, uh, there's my bear claw. Test your bees, I test for viruses, bee gut bacteria, pesticides, herbicides, fungicide, nosema spore counts. Test your bees, test your bees. There's my lab. 
Uh, that's only half of it. Uh, the mass spec is on the other side and it's just as messy. And I want to thank Pat Bono and B. Wellness for setting up this opportunity to share the data and for coordinating the beekeepers and BPS for sample processing over the last few years. I couldn't have done it without you, Pat, and your coordination and for the beekeepers. Thank you. And many thanks to the beekeepers who had to wait for me to run other samples. So there are a lot of viruses detected out there. What is a beekeeper to do? Uh, test your bees. And if you've got a virus that's uh, growing, feed your bees. Uh, I find that the, uh, my experience and from guys answering questions is to feed them uh, protein. It seems to go along with what Marla Spivak out of Minnesota was saying and what Gloria was saying, feed them fresh protein. Uh, how does my technology and process differ from that of the used for the National Honeybee Health Survey virus analysis? I don't use, um, have you compared the results? Do they match up? Why is your lab not re referenced more in these analysis used in honeybee virus research? Uh, okay. I got army technology. The technology does not use reagents. It does not use a primer. I, it looks for genetic material. And my, my best answer to that is, is that PCR and the integrated virus detection system uh, were developed about five years apart. The IVEDS instrument, the one I'm using came along uh, later and all the money was going into molecular methods and techniques where they put a lot of money into PCR. PCR became the gold standard. It got the head start. The army could not use PCR for the battlefield. They needed the non-specific virus detection. They needed to find viruses on the battlefield in about five minutes. And then it takes me about 15 minutes when I, because I go into greater detail for the honeybees than what the uh, battlefield needed. So if it takes about, back at the time that this was developed, it took about two weeks to make a virus. It takes about two years to find it if you don't understand it. You reference back to those phylogenetic trees. If you don't have the specific primer, you're not going to see it. So my technology, my technology, it, 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 uh, it's there. Uh, one of the researchers said, don't compare them, use both. Uh, essential oils effect on viruses. I had a brief study and that's where I came up with peppermint oil. Yes. What does BVS stand for? Biological virus screening. Or I couldn't spell vacation Bible study, so it came up BVS. <laughs> what is higher is better and the lower numbers are better. Higher numbers, if you want gut bacteria, you're gonna want higher numbers. If you have environmental bacteria, you're going to want lower numbers. I just, I just, I just scale them, and I don't have a reference scale for these. We're just going to develop that over time. Why is no one else using this uh, technology? Be researchers, universities. The University of Montana uses it quite a bit. State of Florida Department of Agriculture uses it quite a bit. California uses it quite a bit. Commercial beekeepers use it quite a bit. Uh, we've even had some Canadian beekeepers send bees to me and uh, because there aren't a lot of instruments and most of the money is in molecular biology. I've had a molecular biologist in my lab looking at it and he goes, okay, how did you do that? I didn't see you put the reagent in. Do it again. So we did it again. I still don't see the reagents. And don't do the reagents. And he looks at it and goes, wow, that was really cool. He came from the Rocky Mountain Lab, which is just down the road from me. How should I treat for Varroa? When and how often is the best treatment? I am not the best to answer the Varroa treatment. There is a schedule, follow that. Uh, or go to Pat and ask her. What does the bee weight tell you? Why is this data significant? Fat bees are healthy bees. You want fat bees. Uh, measure it against your bees that uh, over time and you'll follow your bee weight going up and down. I put it in there significantly to look at others and you can see it. Uh, so yes, your bee weight is a good uh, um, 
good reference point to how, how your bees are doing. What would it be a good probiotic for bees? The one that works. <laughs> so there's a lot of probiotics. I've talked with all of them. Uh, and you come back to the plants that are out there. There's some basic ones that need to be in the bee gut. You need to put them in there. Yeah, I'd, I'd look for the additive of enzymes. Uh, any evidence that the bees are picking up fungicide from the almonds, ingesting it and having an effect on their gut bacteria? Uh, it acts as a, I'm, I'm looking at that. I don't have that yet, but uh, yes. First time I saw bees with a fungicide, they looked like they were hit, looks like they were all, uh, they were all in the hive. They were doing nothing. And uh, they treated them and went away after a few days. It looked like they had uh, chronic bee paralysis virus. Uh, typically for my uh, beekeepers, I charge $50 a sample to give all of that data for you. Uh, can I feed uh, with honey supers on? Yes, uh, be creative. Can you go over the neonic effect on the microbiome very briefly again? The slide went by too fast. I am so sorry for that, but yes. Um, the neonics, uh, uh, one of their side effects is a couple of them. One is they affect the virus. The virus will, deformed wing virus will take off. Uh, they will suppress the gut biome. Uh, not all of them. And what would be a good protein? I, there are several good proteins out there. That would be shop around for a supplier and 16% would probably be a good one for this time of year. Maybe we shouldn't feed bees with honey frames of dead out, uh, with a, of a dead out eye. No, probably not. Uh, it's not the honey that you would be worried about, but I pick up all the other stuff uh, and the frames do carry stuff. I just tested a bunch of them. They had a lot of viruses on them. Where would we find info on how to submit samples to you? Uh, Pat Bono has that data. Uh, you can go to my website, bvs-inc.us. bvs-inc.us. Uh, and you're welcome. How do you feel about using Novazit in the fall and spring to control Nozema? I've seen it work. Uh, uh, I have no opinion on that. Uh, you mentioned uh, probiotics a number of times, suggesting it is a positive for honeybee health. I have not heard of any, but are you aware of any studies that show any honeybee probiotic being marketed now have an actual impact on viral loads on honeybee colony? Yes, viral testing application. I've seen uh, people put probiotics on um, and I've seen both answers didn't do anything. And yes, the bees are thriving. Uh, my answer for they're not doing anything is that they put on a probiotic. The bees were already had those bacteria in their gut. It's not that it was bad. It's just that it didn't answer a question. What is American fowl brood? It is a bacteria and we have crud out here uh, that's related to it. Is there a good reference to go to learn more about potential of probiotics. Uh, Google it. Uh, bro probiotics for bees. Go to Strong Microbials. They have tons of papers out on it. How do you apply peppermint oil? Very carefully. Uh, there's a couple references. Uh, Joe Armin, or not Joe Armin, Dr. Armin out of Kansas did that about 10 years ago. Do you test for pesticides? If so, how many chemicals? 15 chemicals and herbicides and fungicides, and I'm adding more to it, it is included in the $50 cost. I don't let, separate them out. I've got an assembly line. Uh, should we be wearing disposable gloves when working with bees? Uh, or you can wash your hands. Uh, you should wash your equipment between hives. Yes, and just clean them off, sterile methods. They, you know, just take them and run them in alcohol. Uh, one for the equipment, one for me. I mean, you know, yes, clean your equipment. Uh, bleach is good. You want to do a 20% or better solution. Uh, what do you think is the biggest health issue now facing beekeepers uh, and in the future? The viruses are there. The bee gut biome is there. How we treat the plants in the field is there. 
monoculture is there. And I think uh, we're killing off the microbes in the soil. The plants are losing nutrition. Uh, the bees are not getting the nutrition out of the pollen. And I think it is a large picture using, looking at how do we control the chemicals and how do we use the chemicals and is there something better. Any evidence of sunflowers for bee gut health? It's a good source of pollen. Uh, the bees do go get pollen. And I don't have a reference for peppermint oil, but uh, Jeff Pettis followed me on a speaking uh, tour. He followed me and I talked about essential oils and he got up right after me, said, essential oils are, are okay. Don't know much about them. But he does know that if you put too much on, you're going to uh, kill your bees. So be careful if you're using essential oils. Follow somebody else's lead, don't make it up. I don't know about stopping migratory beekeeping for preventing spreading viruses between states. Do not know. I do. I did check uh, the last couple of years worth that went of uh, LCMS for viruses, human viruses on the bees, and we have found some common cold viruses on the bees. Uh, we have not found COVID-19. You don't need to stop it. <laughs> don't need to treat the bees or do stop the migratory. I think if you just take care of your bees, keep them healthy, they will fight it off. Okay, that was the end of the questions. All right, well, we made it, nine, um, it's 8.30, that's our time limit, and um, Dave, thank you very much. So, Pat, thank you. Everybody that's here, thank you guys very much. It was great. I enjoyed doing this. Um, you guys have a, have a great weekend, have a great evening. Thank